Hello, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this workshop. I am really sorry I cannot present live now, but um, it's 2 a.m. Seattle time where I live in Washington State in the U.S. So I think you're better off with me recording my talk. So I'm going to talk today about optimizing vaccine allocation for COVID-19 and the potential role of single dose vaccination. Okay, so I started this work back in May 2020, when it was clear that a vaccine would be our best tool to control the COVID-19 pandemic. And so it was also clear that shortages of vaccine were going to be inevitable, and that there was this urgent need to come up with a science-based prioritization rationale. And so what we did is we used an H-structured mathematical model, and we paired that with optimization algorithms that uh, to determine optimal vaccine allocation under a wide variety of assumptions. And we actually split this work into two different questions. The first question was who should get the prioritized to get the COVID-19 vaccines first? And to do that, we used a mathematical model, pretty standard by now. It has 16 age groups and people can be susceptible, they become infected and they go to this exposed phase then they can either be asymptomatic or presymptomatic. And if they are presymptomatic, they will develop a mild infection or be hospitalized either in a general bed or in the ICU. And then everybody either uh, recovers or dies here. And then on top of that, we add the, the vaccination layer and it's exactly the same, except that it has some of these rates modified based on the vaccine effectiveness. And so the key assumptions for this model, we use the population uh, of Washington state, it's 7 uh, million people. And the population was divided into five big vaccination groups. We consider vaccine effectiveness ranging from, against the infection, sorry, very important, ranging from 10 to 100%. We didn't know back in May if we were going to have a vaccine, let alone how efficacious that vaccine was going to be. We didn't know how much vaccine would be available if we had a vaccine. So we, so we varied vaccination coverage uh, enough to vaccinate 10 to 100% of the population. And then we started with 1,000 current infections and 20% of the population previously infected and now immune. And an R not of three. And in terms of the optimization, we minimize four different metrics of disease burden that represents different things that public health officials might be interested in. The first one was symptomatic infections, and that's a proxy for transmission, deaths for obvious reasons, and then maximum number of non-ICU and ICU hospitalizations. And these last two are a proxy for healthcare burden. And you can imagine that if, if I give you a strategy that, um, that keeps these numbers below a certain threshold, then I can, we can guarantee that the numbers will be kept below that threshold throughout the epidemic. And so the optimization was done in two steps. First, we did a grid search in a mesh that divided all the available vaccine in 5% increments. And we selected the best 25 solutions from that grid search, and we used them as initial points in a heuristic optimization algorithm. And so here are the results. And I'm just showing you uh, minimizing bits. And so each of these panel represents assuming a different vaccine efficacy, ranging from 10 to 100%. And then each row here represents having a different coverage, ranging from 10% to 100% of the total population. And then each column represents each vaccination group, and the colors tell, tell you what percentage in that group you should vaccinate. And so, for example, if I uh, concentrate in this red square, what this is saying is that if a vaccine is 40% efficacious and I want to minimize this, and I only have 10% enough vaccine to cover 10% of the population, then the optimal strategy is to vaccinate all of those in the oldest age group, 75 and older, and then use the remainder vaccine in those who are age 65 to 75. And then although this looks very complicated, if you take a step back and you look only at the first row, actually all those panels are telling you the same story. And what they are telling you is that 
if you have a vaccine that is not very efficacious, so that V is less than 50%, then you start vaccinating always the high risk groups who are the older adults in our model. And then as you can cover them, you go down in decreasing order in age and you vaccinate uh, people in that order. However, if you have a highly efficacious vaccine with V of 60% or more, then there's this threshold that you can see here at 50% and here at 40, 30, et cetera. And what that threshold tells me is that if I have low supply, so if I, if I have vaccine uh, to cover, for instance, here 50% or, or less of the population, then the optimal allocation strategy to minimize deaths is the same as I told you before. You start vaccinating the high risk groups, the older adults, and then you go down in decreasing order by age. But if you have a lot of vaccine available to you, then there's this switch by which then the optimal thing to do is to uh, switch and, and vaccinate the children and the young adults, because those are the high transmission groups. And so by vaccinating the high transmission groups, you're indirectly protecting the high risk groups. And so the conclusion or the main conclusions for this project is that if B is less than 50%, then it is optimal to prioritize the older adults first because those are, they are the highest risk of death. If B is, is 60% or more, then with low vaccine coverage, it is optimal to allocate vaccine to the high risk groups. But as more vaccine becomes available, there's a switch to prioritize the high transmission groups. And I didn't show you this, but you can prevent half of the deaths with only 35% of the, of the population optimally vaccinated, as long as VE is more than 50%. And so that paper was published in Science Advances. It was a collaboration with Julie Eaton at University of Washington in Tacoma, Stephanie Long and Elizabeth Brown at Fred Hodge. And so this was a very nice set of results, but in that paper, we only considered a single dose vaccination and we didn't explicitly model the vaccination campaign. And so by the fall of 2020, it was clear that most of the approved vaccines were, were going to be given in two doses, at least three weeks apart, and that there were not enough doses and it was important to consider the, the, the vaccination campaign as a whole. And so it's very natural when you have vaccines given in multiple doses to ask the question of it is better to vaccinate twice as many people with a single dose or half of them with the full dosage. And so that's the second big question that we answered. Who should get a COVID-19 vaccine and how many doses they should get? And so to do that, we used a very similar model to the one I described to you before. The only difference really is that here um, from the pre-symptomatic phase, people go to a symptomatic phase where they can recover or go to the hospital, either to a general bed or to the ICU. And then we explicitly model now vaccination with one dose and then vaccination with a second dose, and we explicitly model the vaccination campaign. And so again, the population was divided in the same five vaccination groups that we had before. And we assumed that vaccination was, uh, the vaccination rate was either two or 4% of the population per week over a six months time horizon. And vaccination coverage ranged from 10 to 50% with a single dose. And so basically to give you an idea of what those, these numbers are, when President Biden assumed the presidency in January, 2021, he said that he wanted to vaccinate a hundred million people in the first 100 days. And that's, that corresponds exactly to this 2%, uh, well, that corresponds exactly to this rate. And if we were to vaccinate people at 2% for six months, we would land at this 50% of the population with a single dose, or obviously 25% with two doses. And so by that time, we have seen that um, the epidemic was, was lived very differently in different parts of the world as a result of very different levels of social distancing interventions. And so we knew this was important. And so we, we decided to consider four different levels of social distancing interventions that would result in a, back, in a transmission with an R effective of 1.1, 1.3, 1, 1.5, or 2.4. And this time we minimized five disease metrics, total infections, total symptomatic infections, peak non-ICU hospitalizations, 
peak ICU hospitalizations and deaths. And our vaccines, well, our vaccine effects were also more complicated. So um, for this project, we consider three different vaccine effects. The first one is the, that the vaccine can reduce your probability of acquiring a SARS-CoV-2 infection altogether. That's what I call the SOOPs. But the vaccine can also reduce your probability of developing COVID-19 symptoms after infection, and that's what I call the SIMP. And the vaccine uh, finally can reduce the infectiousness of those that are vaccinated, and that's what we call VI. However, the clinical trials didn't measure any of these effects. What they did measure is what I'm calling V disease, and that's the unconditional effect of vaccine against developing COVID-19 disease or asymptomatic infection. And what I'm putting here is how V disease, what was measured in the trials, is related to what we used in the model. And so in the rest of the talk, we assume that there's roughly an equal contribution of V SUS and V SIMP into these V disease. So that we consider V against symptomatic infection of 90%, because that's what the trials were telling us, that these vaccines were highly efficacious. But this is what the trials measure, and they measure this for two doses. What the trials did not measure was how efficacious was this vaccine after a single dose. And that's what I'm going to call the single dose efficacy, or SDE. And because we didn't have any information on it, we assume three different possibilities. A low SDE, where you get 20% of the overall protection after one dose. A moderate is the where you get roughly, not roughly, exactly half of the protection after one dose that you would have gotten if you have your two doses, or a high is the where you get 80% of the overall protection after one dose. And so throughout the talk, you're going to see these three uh, panels all over the place. And we compared the optimal strategy to two other strategies. So you're going to see a lot of these. Um, figures too. So here is percentage vaccinated in each group. And now I have these five age groups uh, as, as before. And then for instance, this tells me that I need to vaccinate roughly 50% of the population with one dose in light blue and another 20% of uh, the population age 75 or more with two doses in, in dark blue. And that's the optimal allocation strategy as determined by our optimizer. And we compare that to two other strategies. The one, the first one I'm calling it the high risk strategy. And that consists on vaccinating with two doses. And you start with the oldest age group, and then you go in descending order across your age groups. And this is very similar to the strategy that was adopted in the US. And we compare that to the pro rata strategy. And the pro rata strategy is a single dose vaccination strategy. And so roughly, um, it's telling you don't care about the order and you just let people go and get vaccinated. And so that, that is equivalent to saying that you will vaccinate the population according to the proportion of the population in each age group. And so what are the results? So first, I'm going to show you the results with low transmission, so with an R effective of 1.1 or 1.3. And what you're seeing in each of these columns is assuming low, moderate, or, or high single dose efficacy. And in each row here, you're, we are assuming that we have enough vaccine to cover from 10% here to 50% of the population with a single dose. And what this is telling us, if you look at these first two columns, is that if your vaccine has low or moderate efficacy after one dose, then the optimal thing to do, again, again to minimize deaths, is um, to vaccinate the high-risk groups, so the older adults, age 65 and older, with two doses. You can see it here, here, and here. And then if you have a moderate, uh, moderate efficacy after one dose, then you can vaccinate with one dose, those age 50 to 65. In contrast, if you have a, high, a, a vaccine that is highly efficacious after one dose, then the optimal allocation strategy is the pro rata strategy. So you go ahead and vaccinate as, much, as many people as you can. You don't care about the order. And so how good are these strategies? 
And so again, each column represents low, moderate, or high single dose efficacy. And what you're seeing in the first row is a seminar effective of 1.1, and the second row is a seminar effective of 1.3. And you're seeing here the proportion of beds averted. And here is um, the vaccination, the vaccine doses available for single dose coverage. So here you have enough to cover 10% of your population all the way to 50% of your population. And so what these results are saying is that the optimal allocation strategy is a mixed allocation strategy. And you can avert a maximum of 45% more bids uh, using the optimal allocation strategy compared to the green one, which is the pro rata strategy. And you could avert 12% more bids if you use the optimal, that is this blue one, compared to the pink one, compared to the high risk strategy. And as you see, the differences are less important when your vaccine is moderately efficacious. And if your vaccine is highly efficacious, then the optimal allocation strategy is always a pro rata strategy. And you can avert up to 22% more deaths compared to the high risk strategy. But these differences become smaller and smaller as you have more vaccine available to you. And here at 50%, they are negligible. So that using the high risk strategy or the optimal strategy pretty much over the same number of bits. However, I wanna point out that um, that is true in terms of bits, but now I'm showing you here in this panel, in these three panels, the prevalence of infections per 100,000 people and days since we started vaccination. And what you can see here is that even though it averted the same number of bits, the optimal location strategy here in blue is, is doing a much better job at controlling transmission than the high risk strategy. Okay, and then what happens if you are in a situation where you have moderate or high transmission so that your R effective is 1.5 or 2.4? And so in this case, the optimal strategy is always to vaccinate the high risk groups, and those are the older adults in our model. And you do so with two doses if you have a vaccine that is low or moderately efficacious after a single dose. And with one dose, if you have little, if you have uh, low coverage and you have a highly efficacious vaccine, but once you have enough vaccine to cover uh, your, your whole population with two doses of your whole population in these age groups, then you do so and you vaccinate them with two doses and you allocate the remainder with one dose to those age 50 to 64. And how well can you do in this situation? Well, here, the optimal allocation strategy is a high risk strategy if you're in, a, in the low or moderate uh, single dose efficacy scenarios. And you can avert up to 47% more deaths compared to the pro rata strategy. So in brief, using the pro rata strategy when you have a lot of transmission if you have a vaccine that is that has low efficacy after one dose, it's a huge waste of resources. And then the and then if your vaccine is highly efficacious after one dose, then you can avert 23% here or 12% more deaths compared to the pro rod and the high risk strategies, respectively. And again, all of these become less important as you have more and more vaccine available to you. So I want to summarize at this point. Uh, with assuming 50% coverage with a single dose. And so what we saw is that, so again, you have low, moderate, or high single dose efficacy, and now you have low or moderate or high transmission. And what we saw is that for low transmission and low and moderate is the it is optimal to vaccinate the high risk groups first with two doses. And for low transmission and high is the it's optimal to just vaccinate everyone in a pro rata fashion. And in contrast, if you have moderate or high transmission, you have it is always optimal to vaccinate the high risk groups first with two doses for low and moderate SDE, and then a single dose to the to the other age groups. Okay, now I want to show you a little bit of the results of um, how how does this change when you consider other objective functions. And so, as usual, each column is low, moderate, or high SDE. And now each row represents a different objective. And so the first one is total infections, symptomatic infections, peak hospitalizations, peak ICU hospitalizations, and bits. And so 
what you can see, I'm going to concentrate on the high SD scenario, for, for example, is that if you want to minimize transmission, then it is optimal to concentrate the vaccine in these high transmission groups, which are the young adults in our model. However, if you want to minimize the hospitalization or deaths, it is optimal to use the pro rata strategy. And the final thing that I want to discuss is how different vaccine profiles give rise to different optimal vaccine allocations. So at the beginning, I told you that we have considered different vaccine effects and that we considered a vaccine that was um, highly efficacious against, against symptomatic infection with 90%, and that roughly the, that 90% uh, came from equal contributions from the vaccine protecting you from getting infected altogether and the vaccine protecting you from developing symptoms once you were infected. And so that corresponds to this uh, middle row here. However, we wanted to investigate how different, um, different effects would modulate these optimal vaccine allocations. And so on the top row, you are seeing a vaccine that, is all, that has the same 90% efficacy against disease, unconditional disease, but all the 90% is coming from the vaccine preventing you from developing symptoms once you're infected. And on the bottom row, you are is the opposite. So all the is also the against disease is 90%, but in this case, all is coming from a vaccine that is preventing you from getting infected altogether. And so what you can see is that if your vaccine is mediated exclusively by preventing the symptoms, then the optimal allocation strategy always favors the high protection of the high risk groups with the doses regardless of the value of the vaccine efficacy after one dose. However, once a vaccine protects also against getting infected, then the optimal vaccination strategies will uh, favor strategies that will cut down transmission. And so for instance, you can see that here, so here I already discussed this. So you will have a pro rata type allocation strategy when, when you have a highly efficacious vaccine after one dose. Um, and here is the same thing. And here actually, if, you're contrib if, if your vaccine is, is coming all from protecting infection, then you can see here that you are better off giving single dose to most of the people. So in conclusion, uh, if a single dose is highly efficacious, then single dose campaigns are optimal and can avert up to 22% more deaths than the high risk strategies. If single dose has moderate or, or low efficacy, then pro rata campaigns are a huge waste of resources and the optimal strategy can avert up to 45% more deaths than single dose strategies. And so back in January of 2021, and even now, I still believe it is crucial to determine the single dose efficacy, especially that countries that have not received a lot of vaccine yet, it might be very tempting for them to spread out the vaccine by giving one dose to a lot of people. And that could be, as we saw, a huge waste of resources. And with that, I want to thank my collaborators, are Julie Eaton, again, at the University of Washington of Tacoma, and Tiffany Long, Dobromir Dimitro, Josh Schiffer, David Swan, and Holly James at Fred Hodge. This paper was published in Nature Communications in the summer of 2021. And I want to thank Peter Gilbert, who gave me funding to do this work, as, as well as um, the COVID-19 COVID Prevention Network, Fred Hodge, and NIH for funding. And I thank you very much, and I hope I will see you at 4.30 with, uh, and I will be able to answer any questions. Thank you.